So I want to invite you to turn to uh, the book of Song of Songs in the Old Testament. We're closing out this six-week teaching series, and, and I hope you've been present. I hope you, you're taking notes and you, you've engaged with, uh, with this throughout this series, uh, as I believe it's just uh, uh, life-changing uh, for relationships, uh, but not just uh, on the level of friendship. Um, uh, but that of marriage as well. And some of you are saying, well, I'm not married. What does this have to do with me? Uh, perhaps one day you will be married. And so you're looking towards that engagement, looking towards that, that, that marriage uh, and, and beyond just a, a wedding, a ceremony. Uh, then this has everything to do with you. Uh, or perhaps you know someone that is married and that's going through some conflict or, or uh, uh, trials and, and you come alongside of them and be the church. How many of you know that we're called to be the church? Okay, three people know that we're called to be the church. Praise God. I'm, I'm glad those three are with me. And uh, it's going to be it's gonna be a long journey. Okay, we'll bring it up a little bit. Uh, and uh, But we're called to be the church. Man, praise God that church isn't just something that happens on Sunday. But we are the church. And we live worship as a lifestyle. And so it goes much deeper and goes beyond what happens on Sunday. But Sunday, what an awesome opportunity for us to come together and remind us that you are the church and that you are the church and that you are the church and that I am the church. Praise God. Uh, so we're wrapping up the series and we're pressing into this truth today that marriage is a picture of the relationship between God and his people. As we close this, this book and as we close this series we're really pressing into this truth that marriage is a picture of the relationship between God and his people. And so I want to once again just invite you to turn to Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, depending on the translation that you're reading from, uh, looking at chapter 8. And we're going to begin in verse 6. We're going to just press into these two verses in chapter 8 today. Verse 6 and verse 7. Verse 6 and 7 of Song of Songs chapter 8. But before we go there, we're going to, I, I like to share some elements, some elements of an Old Testament Jewish wedding ceremony. You excited about that? I'm sure you are. You're very excited. You're, 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 you're excited about this. Praise God. All right, here we go. So some elements, some elements of an Old Testament, Old Testament Jewish wedding ceremony. The groom and the bride, the groom and the bride would enter into a season of preparation called the betrothal. Turn to the person next to you and let them know we're talking about betrothals. Betrothals. It's probably not grammatically correct, but that's okay. We'll just go with it. The bride and the groom would enter into a season of preparation known as the betrothal. The betrothal was a formal agreement. Don't miss this. It was a formal agreement that could only be broken by divorce. Perhaps you've read through uh, Luke chapter 2, the Christmas account, right? The Christmas account. And you know that Mary and Joseph, they were betrothed. They were betrothed. They were betrothed. And so this was a formal agreement that could only be broken by divorce. Listen, a great marriage takes preparation. We've talked about that throughout the series. A great marriage takes preparation. Many people prepare for the wedding, but not the marriage. And so listen, if you're in that stage of life that you're not married, what an opportunity, what an opportunity to begin to lay a foundation that will last far beyond the day of celebration. But that celebration can actually be lived out within your, within your marriage. How many of you want that? I mean, how many of you want that for your life, but how many of you want that for your children or for the, you know, your, your, your friend's child? I don't care, call somebody, claim somebody. But marriage takes preparation. And many of us are so focused on just one day that, that we don't consider the days that will follow the wedding day. And so marriage takes preparation. Look at verse 6 and verse 7. I love the depth of these two scriptures. The scripture says this, set me as a seal on your heart, as a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death. Jealously, jealousy is as unrelenting as shield. Love's flames are fiery flames, an almighty flame. 
A huge torrent can't extinguish love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. If a man were to give all his wealth for love, it would be utterly scorned. It'd be utterly scorned. Let's go back to the beginning in verse 6. Set me as a seal on your heart, as a seal on your arm. Do you, you see this word seal? Do you see it with me, this word seal? It's the Hebrew, the Hebrew word is chaltham. Turn the person next to you and tell them the Hebrew word. Maybe have a little bit of a rasp in your voice. Chaltham, all right? Go, go for it, go for it. Don't be afraid, okay? 9.30, man, we better get it together here. Don't be afraid. The Hebrew word, this word is seal, uh, can also be referred to as a signet ring, a signet ring. In fact, we have a picture of a signet ring on the screens just for you to be able to see this picture here coming up. It's coming in three, two, one. It's there. Praise God. Wow. The presence of God is here. The presence of his people to be determined. Here we go. Signet ring. Signet Signet ring, this is actually a signet ring that is dated 2,500 years, 2,500 years. Just leave that on the screen as, as I describe the importance of a, of a signet ring. Signet ring was a ring that was very much like a, a credit card, if you will. It's probably the best way for us to understand in today's age. It represented the purchasing power of the authority of the person who, who wore it. When they'd make a transaction, they would place their, their signet, you can see their signet, in that stone. They would, they would place their signet ring on a piece of paper saying, this represents my name. This represents my, my name. And in this text, in, in verse 6, she, she wishes to be united in the closest way with her lover and to be valued as his most precious possessions were valued. And that's what we see as we read this text. Set me as a seal on your heart, as a seal on your arm. Now we can begin to understand and grasp the arm, setting that signet seal on your arm, uh, but it goes much deeper than that within the heart. It goes much deeper than that within the, within the heart. Let's continue with the elements of Old Testament Jewish wedding ceremony. The groom would present the bride's father with a ketubah. Turn to the person next to you and say ketubah. Not, not the instrument tuba, just it's ketubah. And this ketubah means a, a written thing, a written thing. It was a Jewish written agreement. And the importance of this written agreement was this. It outlined the rights and responsibilities of the groom. And so this was an important written document and you can see a picture of that on the screen that is Hebrew if you get close enough you can maybe see it but the ketubah an important piece he would also give the the father the the bride price again going back old testament Jewish wedding ceremony there would be a price to be paid and so the groom would give the the father the the price that he would, he would pay. And then we move over to the proposal. This is, gets exciting here. The man would propose to the woman with a cup of wine. Wine represented God's very best. And some of you are saying, praise God for that. That it's very best. It's very best. That wine represented God's very best. The mothers would then shatter a plate to symbolize the permanency of the betrothal. So you get the picture of what's happening. There's a process taking place. Different elements involved in this process. The groom would place a veil over the bride's face to show that she has entered a covenant to be married. And the veil represented three things, three things. First, the veil represented the bride's the bride's purity bride's purity that's that veil covers her face the bride's purity second she was off limits to any other man and then third she was promised to be married and purchased with a price promised to be married and purchased 
with a price. Once again, elements of an Old Testament Jewish wedding ceremony. The groom would then prepare a chupa. Turn person next to you, let them know chupa. They're preparing this chupa. The chupa was a covering or canopy. And it was a, a sheet that would stretch over four poles. And the bride and groom would stand under this during the ceremony as it symbolized the home that the couple would build together. And there's a, there's a picture that, just a, a painting rather, that, that, that shows, helps us understand this. And it's coming up in three, two, one. There it is. Man, let's give it up for our tech people. This is unrehearsed, by the way. As I said, the presence of God is here. The presence of his people is to be determined. You can see this, uh, this, this piece of art helps us visualize what I'm referring to. The chupa, the canopy, the covering, standing over the bride and the groom. The bride, if you notice, there's a veil that's representing her purity, that's representing she was bought with a price. She was off limits to any other man. And there's a celebration. There's a ceremony. And then the, group, the groom and his friends uh, would blow the shafar, which is a ram's horn. They would blow the shafar to symbolize that the preparations were now complete. And what's interesting about that is the shafar was blown throughout the Old Testament to represent the call to worship. The preparations have been made, and now is the time to enter into worship. It's interesting how the two correlate. The preparations for the wedding and for the marriage have been made. Now the shafar is, is blown, and we can begin the ceremony. The Hebrew word for covenant is baritha. Turn to the person next to you again. Let them just know baritha, baritha. And this is a binding agreement. It's a binding agreement. In a marriage covenant ceremony, there, there are two holy covenants. And if you're married today, you should have re repeated something similar, something along these lines. And if you didn't, see me after and we can Two holy covenants would be established. The first is this. It's a covenant between God, the man, and the wife. And it goes something along the lines of this. This is modern day translation. Will you have this woman to be your wife? To live together under God's standards for marriage? Will you love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health? And stay faithful to her so long as you both shall live. I've had the privilege and honor to, to share these words with, with many that are present here today. And I look forward to the many years ahead of us to be able to unite the man and the wife under the foundation of the Lord God. The second covenant would be between the man and the wife. Over 13 years ago, I repeated the, something similar after the pastor, I, Tim, I, Tim, take you, Audra, to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer. And we, we, we leaned in on that one. In sickness, in sickness and in health. <laughs> A lot of sickness lately. To love and to cherish till death do us part. And then we added a, a line that, that, that most uh, times you, you don't hear. According to God's holy ordinance, I pledge to you my love. And so there's two covenants, two holy covenants that exchanged within the ceremony. And then to symbolize, symbolize this covenant, the bride and, and groom would exchange uh, rings would exchange rings, and these rings are the outward, invisible sign of the inward and spiritual covenant made one to another before God. 
marriage, as I said, is a picture of the relationship between God and his people. Would you turn to the New Testament book of Hebrews with me? The New Testament book of, of Hebrews. Chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. It's near the end of the Bible. Hebrews chapter 7. Beginning in verse 22. Hebrews chapter 7, as you're turning, is really a beautiful picture of the new covenant that we we have with the Lord because of Jesus. The old covenant's been done away with because Jesus entered the scene and changed everything. I don't know if that excites you, man, but that excites me. That over 2,000 years ago, my Lord and Savior, he came to this earth, he walked this earth, he took beatings, mockings, he went to a cross and was crucified. He went to a grave, and was buried, and three days later, he rose victorious for me and for all humanity. And that's something to celebrate, not just on a Sunday, but every day that we wake up and have life, church, that we're in a new covenant, that no longer, no longer do I have to go back to the old covenant and the old way of doing things and go before someone and go through all of these traditions of forgiveness, but that I'm eternally forgiven because of Jesus Christ. That's the new covenant that we're talking about. Look at verse 22, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22. Because of this oath, and you could see in, in verse 20, the oath that they were referring to, none of this happened without an oath, for, for others be, became priests without an oath, but he became a priest with an oath made by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. That's, that's the context. Because of this oath, verse 22, Jesus has also become the guarantee of a better covenant. Jesus... Jesus has also become a, the guarantee of a better covenant. As we enter a new covenant, don't miss this, as we enter a new covenant between, new covenant with our spouse, we, we, also, we also enter and live in a new covenant with God for those that have called upon Jesus as Savior that Jesus guarantees a better covenant. Look at uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, one of my favorite scriptures in all the word of God. For the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin is death. We we all understand what a wage is in this room, or I I hope we do. A wage is something we earn and deserve. A wage is something we earn and deserve, and because of the sin in our life, what we earn and deserve is is death, death. And what that word death means literally uh, translated as separation from God. That's what we earn and deserve because of sinful man. We earn and deserve death, the one thing, the only thing. And so next time it begins to build up within you and flow through your mouth, you know that thought, those words, I deserve this or I deserve that. Can I just encourage you to pause and say, no, you don't. The only thing we earn and deserve according to the authority of the word of God is separation from holy God, death, hell. I know that's not the fluffiest kind of lightest message, by the way. Some of you are like, man, I didn't come here for this. Listen, let me just lean in just with me. Just don't, don't miss this. Thank God the scripture doesn't stop there because of the access and the availability of what comes through a new covenant relationship with God. It says, but the free gift of God, the free gift, turn to the person next to you, let them know it's a free gift. The free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's eternal life. It's nothing that you could ever earn or I could ever deserve, but it's been granted as a gift. Jesus has guaranteed this as a gift, this new covenant is made possible. I want you to know that today. All across this room, this this new covenant with God has been made possible through Jesus. Look at verse 25. Therefore, 
He is able to save completely those who come to God through him. Since he always lives to intercede for them. Do you, do you see that verse? Do you see that scripture, verse 25? He is able to save completely, completely those who come to God through him. God arranged, this is what it, God arranged a way for us to know him through Jesus Christ. It was Jesus that made this claim in John 14, verse 6. John 14, verse 6, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through, through me. The only way we can enter this new covenant is through Jesus, the guarantor, the one who made it possible. The only way we can go from that old life to the new life, the only way we could ever be forgiven of all of our sins, past, present, and future, is through Jesus Christ. The only way we can walk with a living hope, the only way we can experience the joy and the peace that the world is longing for is through Jesus and Jesus alone. The only way we can have a hope in heaven one day is through Jesus and Jesus alone. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I wonder if you believe that today. Verse 27, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 27, would you look with me? I love this. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as high priests do. Again, that's the glimpse of the, the old covenant, the high priest making these sacrifices. First for their own sins, then for those of the people. Don't miss this next part, church. He did this once for all time when he offered himself. That changes everything. He did this once and for all time. That's how we can connect eternal life because he went to the cross once and for all time. He was placed upon that cross, took upon the sins of humanity, was crucified. As he died on that cross once and for all time. As I shared the elements of the Old Testament Jewish wedding ceremony, I shared there was a price to be paid for the bride. There was a price to be paid for the bride. The groom would make his offer, if you will. And I know in 2020, that doesn't sound so good. But it's the fact. He would make a price. And I want you to know today that you and I were purchased with a high price. Not so that you could remain in your sin, live in darkness, act as if nothing has transpired in your life, but that you could be radically changed through Jesus and Jesus alone. You and I were bought with a high price. 1 Corinthians 6, 20, for God bought you with a high price. He paid a high price for you and for me, so you must honor God with your body. What a call to purity across the board. What a call for a difference in the church. When the community looks at us and they see us, what, what, are, they, what are they seeing in you? What are they seeing in me? What are they hearing in you? What are, what are they hearing in me? Look at Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. Now the main point of what is being said is this. Don't, don't miss this. Hebrews 8, verse 1. Now the main point of what is being said is this. We have this kind of high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Who sat down at the right hand of the throne of of the majesty in heavens. Listen, church, Jesus, Jesus went to prepare a place for us. Let's set it up like this. Jesus, he's crucified on a cross. He's placed in a grave. As I shared already, he, he rose victorious from the grave. Three days later, he rose victorious. He's walking around this 
earth. He, he, he sees about 500 people. Scripture tells us that. I'm just going to make up numbers. He sees about 500 people. He has conversations. They touch him. They feel, are you, it's really you. You're alive. Then he gathers his disciples. He gathers his disciples. And what does he do? In Acts chapter one, verse eight, he says, listen, I'm out of here, but I'm not leaving you alone. I'm out of here, but I'm empowering you. I'm filling you up with power. How many of you have experienced his power lately? How many of you need to experience his power today? Lord God, there's power, living power in me. There's living power in me. And some of you just need to wake up tomorrow and say that. Thank you, God, that there's living power in me. I'm alive today because of you. And so he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Can you let that sink in just for a moment? I'm going to prepare a place for you. Still keeps his promise throughout the ages that I will be with you. From Genesis all the way to Revelation, we find the promise. I will be with you. Don't be afraid. Be strong and courageous. I'm with you. He still keeps it because he says, I'm sending the Holy Spirit who will empower you. He's going to prepare a place. And during this season, listen, we are being prepared. We are being prepared for the return of Christ. And what does that really look like? What that means is this, one of the only things that we will not be able to do in heaven is share the gospel that Jesus loves, that Jesus saves, that Jesus is enough with all those that God places in our life. Bringing as many people with us as possible. I mean, think about it like that. That God wants to use you and use me. That's why you're at where you're at. That's why you're going through what you're going through. Uh, once again, stop questioning what you're going through. Why am I in this job? Why did I lose my job? Where am I going? Why am I living in this town? Why am I living in this, this home, in this community? Why am I placed in this school? I want to be over there. We ever stop and think that God has placed you strategically for the advancement of his kingdom. And the question is, will we be faithful until he returns. Will we be faithful till he returns? 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. Don't miss that. One day, one day, the shafar will sound, and all the dead in Christ will rise first. One day there's going to be a blast of a trumpet. Man, he's coming back. He's returning. I don't know if you're excited about that. I don't know if you, you, you maybe just questioning, man, what does this really look like, God? I, I don't know. I want more time here on earth. I, I don't know where you stand if you're not just ready, but one day he's coming. And the question is, will you be ready when he returns? As I said, as I said, what this really looks like to us is, is, Marriage is, is a picture of the relationship between God and his people. As we enter the new covenant with God, we're saved and set free. We're called his bride. And I know that's for some of us, that's hard to understand. But, but that's the reality. And that's what scripture teaches. That we're called his bride because of the new covenant that we've entered. And so once again, Jesus is coming back. And the question is, will you be ready? Will you be part of this celebration in eternity? Revelation chapter 19, verse seven. Let us be glad and rejoice. Let us give honor to him. For the time has come for the wedding feast of the lamb and his bride has prepared herself. I wonder where you're at today. Would you just take a moment to consider where you stand today? Maybe there's someone here today, you've never surrendered your life over to Jesus and that would be your first step. Jesus, I'm making you Lord. I, I'm no longer trying to do this life on my own. I, I understand that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. So I surrender to you today. But perhaps 
There's others here today that would say, Tim, I'm a born again believer. Man, I am saved and set free, but I just wanna move in a little closer. I wanna move in a little closer. So I've asked my bride to sing the song and just really set us up to answer where we stand today. And so will you listen to these words as they lead us? across this place, would you just bow your heads and close your eyes and, and just consider what I just shared, the message that we find even in the words of these songs, you won't relent until you have it all. I wonder if you've surrendered it all to him. I want you to know that today could be the day, the greatest day of your life. That if you're in a place where you're just like, I just don't know. Can I just tell you that Jesus loves you? with a greater love than any other man or woman will ever be able to share and show. And the greatest demonstration according to Romans 5, 8 is that Jesus came to die while we were yet sinners. And so if there's someone here today that you would say, Tim, I wanna surrender my life over to Jesus. Today is the day of salvation for me. Today is the day of salvation for me. Would you just have the courage all across this room to pray to the living God? I wanna lead you in, I wanna lead you in that. So if that's you today, you you say, Tim, I'm not saying I wanna be saved. I wanna be set free. I wanna experience this hope that you've been talking about. I wanna enter this new covenant with God. Would you pray with me all across this place? Dear Jesus, call upon his name, dear Jesus. I know that I am a sinner and I ask you today to forgive me, to clean me up. I surrender everything over to you. I believe that you came to this earth, that you died on a cross, you were placed in a grave and you rose from the grave for me so that I could have life, so that I could be forgiven. And so I trust in you today. I believe in you. I believe in you. 
Would you just thank him all across this place if that's your prayer today, that's your desire, your heart's desire? Would you just thank him? Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. As you're thanking him, perhaps there's others that just wanna move in a little closer. You just wanna move in a little closer today. So all across this place, would you just tell the Lord that? Say, Jesus, I wanna move in just a little closer. I wanna get to know you a little better. I wanna live a life that honors you completely. And so I thank you for the reminder today of your great love, your grace and your mercy. And until you return, I wanna make you known. As people are still praying all over this place, perhaps there's some, some marriages here today that you would say, Tim, this message, this series has spoken to our hearts. And we wanna make a, the commitment, the recommitment to love one another, to honor one another, to serve one another. With the help of God. So as I pray, would you just, would you just lean into your spouse? And would you just pray? Would you just pray over them just for a moment? Maybe it's something that you're not accustomed to doing. But men, could I just ask you just to, to step up and, and just to pray just over your bride? And so Lord, thank you. Thank you for this word today. Thank you for how good you are to us. Lord, thank you for how much you love us. The plans that you have for us. Lord, and we celebrate you today. May we live in such a way that reflects that. Lord, I praise you for the ones that made a decision today to surrender everything over to you, to call upon you as Lord. Lord, I, I pray today for those that said, I just want to get a little closer to Jesus. Move in just a little closer. Lord, I pray that they would start and stop some different things in their lives to do that. That you would speak to them and show them what that looks like. Lord, I pray for all the marriages in the house. Lord, we need your power. We need your power, God. We need your wisdom. We need your love. Lord, your humility. I pray that all of those things would be on display within all the marriages in the house today. Lord, that there would be renewal, there would be restoration, and that the world would look on these marriages and say, oh, that must be of the Lord. So we love you, we thank you, we praise you, and it's in your name that we pray, amen. Amen.